You are listening to The Overwhelmed Brain. Today's episode is brought to you by GetOutOfTheMess.com. Let Asha, your Legal Shield associate, connect you to a legal insurance plan that's right for you. Quality attorneys at established law firms for about $20 a month. I can afford that. Are you annoyed by affirmations? Are you tired of that same old, rehashed, personal growth advice that all seems to boil down to, think positively and all your problems will go away? If affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like denial, then I want you to get ready. The Overwhelmed Brain is here to help you create the life you want now. Hello, this is Paul Coliani, personal empowerment coach and host of The Overwhelmed Brain. And this is the personal growth show for the critical thinker. On every episode, we'll talk about practical down-to-earth steps to help you improve your mood and keep you sane in this powerful journey we call life. I want to help you bridge the gap between your emotions and reason, causing you to discover why you do the things you do and what you can do to reach higher levels of happiness and lower levels of stress and overwhelm. Everything I talk about on the show should not be mistaken for actual medical advice or treatment and is intended to be for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult your physician before making any changes to your medical treatment. What you'll find here is an increase in your emotional intelligence, a strengthening of your self-worth and self-esteem, the motivation to be your authentic self, and the forward momentum to help you learn, heal, grow, and evolve. Now, speaking of strengthening your self-worth and your self-esteem, let's talk about your sense of self. I received a uh, quite a content-filled message, the content being every possible downfall that someone can have, every possible challenge that someone could have. Uh, you look at someone's life and you go, wow, you've experienced a lot. And you think, gee, my life isn't so bad compared to yours. <laughs> I know there are some people that I can think of right offhand in my immediate family. And uh, I know that you probably can think of those people. And maybe you are you might be one of those people that think, no, that's me. <laughs> Everything that could have happened has happened. So what happens in a lifetime of uh, challenge, obstacles, uh, failure, struggle, abuse, trauma, what happens in that lifetime is that your sense of self, your identity is either rewritten and you become uh, someone that you really aren't, and we'll, we'll get into this a little bit, uh, or you become uh, disintegrated. You become less than yourself. And when I say disintegrated, I want you to think of it as disintegration. When you're integrated, all of you is there. All of your, quote, parts are in place. And when you're disintegrated, you suddenly have parts of you that are out of place or wiped out, or at least it appears that way. If those parts of you are wiped out or disintegrated over time, whether they were slowly chipped away at or completely obliterated, in one instance, you don't feel whole, or at least the wholeness you feel isn't of purity. It isn't clear. It isn't, um, it doesn't feel healthy. You don't like it. You look at your life and you check inward and sense how you feel. How do I feel? Well, I'm fine, but you know, I have this under layer of sadness or under a layer of anger, or I'm always in a hypersensitivity, hypervigilant mode. Uh, I'm always highly observant of my uh, uh, surroundings because I'm kind of paranoid. I'm worried about the next problem that's going to happen in my life, so on and so on. So you become less of yourself over many, many traumatic, impactful moments. And a lot of this is just life, right? You can have a marriage that ends up in divorce, and that's traumatic. You can have someone you love die, and that's traumatic. You can lose a job and lose money, and that's traumatic. But we all go through that. But what is your foundation when you're going through it? What is your emotional foundation? If your emotional foundation was chipped away at and you became disintegrated, 
your foundation became disintegrated and uh, your confidence became disintegrated, your um, competence became disintegrated because you started trusting yourself less and less. So you did worse and worse over time, even though you might have the skill set, but you started to trust yourself less because of the decisions you were making weren't panning out right. So you have this history of a broken foundation. So when the impactful things in life happen, because they always happen, they'll happen. The, the impactful things in life are going to happen. And the sense of self, who you are, when they happen, plays a big role in that. Who am I? Who am I going to be when this happens? How am I going to respond? Will I be responding from a place of confidence, knowing I can get through anything, or absolute fear, knowing that this could be the last incident that does me in? So it's important to establish who you are and how do you do that. Uh, one of the things that I like to tell people when they're looking for, who am I? Uh, what is my identity? Uh, I can't even relate to myself. I don't even know me anymore, is to check inward and figure out what you will accept and what you won't accept. This is Personal Boundaries 101. Check inward and go, what will I accept in my life? Now, the problem is, is if you've been a victim for a long time, is that your toleration and resilience levels are way up. <laughs> your standards are low and your resilience is way up. And you will be tolerant of bad behavior the longer you've been a victim and the longer you've played a victim. Not only playing the victim, meaning you're in a relationship, you know you should get out, but you don't and you stay and it becomes more and more toxic. You feel more and more maybe abused in many ways, whether physically or emotionally. And uh, you can look at this and go, well, I made those choices because I feel like I have no choice. There's that kind of role. And then there's the other role where you get bad luck after bad luck and it hits you hard. And again, if you don't have that strong emotional foundation behind you, then you don't know how to respond in a healthy way that uh, leads to a better day tomorrow. And that is the first step. When you can respond in a healthy way that paves the way for tomorrow, that is the first giant leap of faith because now you're doing something for you instead of for someone else. I mean, how often do you do things for you when you're in a place of fear? It's rare. When I was in a place of fear, I became a people pleaser. And I just said yes to people all the time. Hey, can you work the weekend? Sure, I'll work the weekend because otherwise you might fire me. Hey, do you mind getting up at 3 a.m. and driving me to the airport? Sure, no problem, because I want you to like me. I want to keep you as a friend. It was never out of, why wow, I really appreciate this guy and I'll do anything for him. Or, hey, I'm going to store my car in your yard for a couple of weeks. I hope that's okay. And I'll go, sure, no problem. Just store it in the yard. I don't care about the oil leak and <laughs> the fact that the grass is going to die in that spot because it can't get any sun. Don't worry about it. No problem. I just want to keep you as a friend. <laughs> that's the inner thought process that happens, right? I want to keep that person as a friend. I want that person to like me. But then I got to a point where I'm like, wait a minute, why? Why do I want that person to like me if they're taking advantage of me? That doesn't make any sense. Why do I want that person to love me if love means they support my happiness? And by doing that, they don't really love me because they can see that I'm unhappy. Of course, there's a whole twisted psychological perspective that we can take on this. You know, uh, if you don't show the person that you're upset, then they'll never know. So they think that you're happy about the things they're doing. So they repeat the things they're doing on and on and on. Just listen to my episode on uh, people pleasing. You'll get the point. <laughs> but my focus today is on developing a sense of self and knowing what's right and what's wrong inside you, for you, knowing what is acceptable to you and what is not. And like I was saying, if you've developed a high resilience to what is unacceptable to you, then this becomes harder and harder over time. And the older you get, the longer it goes, uh, the more people are allowed to take advantage of you, whether they know they're taking advantage or not, the longer it goes, the harder it is, the higher the hurdle you have to jump. 
the bigger the cliff you have to jump off of in a leap of faith manner, not in a physical reality manner. In the sense that when you do something healthy for yourself, it feels like a massive leap of faith because you've never seen the results of doing certain healthy things for yourself. Sure, you can go to the gym. (laughs) Sure, you can eat right. But standing up for yourself in front of someone else? How often do we do this? Um, Hopefully, more often than not, yes, there are some people that are unsafe and you can't do it with them. But when you run into people that are just neutral, you don't know if they're going to attack you or not, but you never find out what their reaction is because you have been the way you are for a long time. Assuming that you feel like you need to say yes when you really mean no. I'm talking about a little bit of people pleasing here. And uh, also not standing up for yourself. Not showing people where your boundaries are, where the line is. So how do you step into this and what does it have to do with uh, a sense of self? Well, I fully believe once you know what's acceptable and what's not and you honor yourself, honor your boundaries, and let people know when they've crossed the line, that's when your sense of self starts building. That's when you start reinforcing that you are worthy, that you are amazing, that you deserve to be treated in a good way, that you deserve to be loved. When you don't stand up for yourself, you reinforce that you don't deserve any of those things. I'm being a little harsh, but I'm doing this on purpose because I want you to know that when you treat yourself as worthy, as lovable, as the fantastic person you are, then it's easier to stand up for yourself knowing that that's what you're protecting. That's what you're honoring. So if we look at the typical people pleaser behavior, we're going to see that they honor others over themselves. If we reverse that and do it with ourselves, we honor ourselves over others. Can you do that? (laughs) Will you do that for me? (laughs) What I want you to do is start understanding that every time you honor someone dishonoring you, you disintegrate yourself. You disintegrate and leave yourself in pieces, scattered. You do not feel whole. Let me repeat that. Every time you honor someone else dishonoring you, you know what it feels like when someone dishonors you. You disintegrate and leave yourself in pieces. So if that's not enough to get to a point where you honor yourself, then let me throw this at you. Because some people will hear this and go, yes, but uh, I'm still afraid. I'm still scared to do it. And some people will say, and I've heard this, I don't even know what honoring myself means. I didn't even know I was not honoring my own boundaries because I didn't even know about boundaries. I've had clients say that to me. I've had people write to me and say, you know, you're teaching about honoring boundaries, but what are boundaries? I mean, they don't ask me what they are, but they pretty much say they don't know what they are or didn't know what they were until they listened to my show. Well, let me tell you this. I didn't know what they were until like 12, 13 years ago when I met someone who honored her boundaries. That was when I was married. She said things to me that protected herself in a way that was still loving toward me, but saying, hey, I can't have that in my life. When I was exposed to that, I was like, what? I've never been with someone who who acted like you. (laughs) It was like a phenomenon. It was a foreign concept to me. And the day she walked into the room, I remember this, Two months after we met, she walked into the room. I had the music on really loud, and she gave me the worst look. And I was like, oh, my God, she's mad at me. (laughs) So I turned down the music, and I was like, what's wrong? And she goes, when I told you to turn down the music and you turned it up, that really hurt my feelings. And I was like, what? I I didn't even know you said that. I I, I had the music on loud already, so I didn't even know she said it. And uh, coincidentally, she yelled up the hall and said, will you please turn that down that music? I didn't hear it, and right at that time, I turned it up. So it was almost like she took it as if I was, were defying her, that I didn't care what she thought. And for her to come in the bedroom and not hold it in and just say something like that, 
she immediately got it off her chest and we immediately talked about it. And, you know, obviously the misunderstanding was exposed and I felt bad still, but I didn't hear her. I didn't hear her say that. And she understood and it was done and over with. Before, in my previous relationships, something like that would have gone down like this. My girlfriend would have yelled up the hall and in this scenario, I didn't hear her. So I would turn up the music because I was enjoying it. And then that would have been the end of it. That's it. She wouldn't have come in the room. And in fact, she would have swallowed that anger and held on to it. And then when I was done in the room, she would either A, yell at me. I can't believe you son of a, why would you do that? Or not say anything and let it fester inside of her so that she carried it as uh, an emotional wound or trigger throughout our relationship. That's what happened to my past. That's what I would do. <laughs> that was my behavior. I would get internally upset and I would stuff all that negative, toxic emotion down in, into me. I would swallow it and stuff it into my gut. <laughs> I'm going to use some descriptive words. Just stuff it down there. And then I would hold on to it and you know I would protect that negativity inside of me so that it never came out in anger, never came out uh, with me lashing out at anyone. Now, I would do it uh, in private, and I would have this really intense anger when no one was looking, but uh, I would never express it to the person I was with. So to meet someone that um, actually expressed themselves immediately, right when it happened, uh, was eye-opening for me. And I always thought, you're supposed to repress this, aren't you? Isn't that how people communicate nowadays? Yes, it is. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're taught to repress, not express, and help disintegrate ourselves. That's what happened to our parents, at least the dysfunctional ones that I'm talking about. Uh, my parents, uh, especially my mom, held back. Anything she wanted to say to anyone never came out. Because saying it meant confrontation. She doesn't want confrontation. So she passed that wonderful communication gene on to me. And I learned to communicate in a way that uh, pleased everyone. I was Mr. Squeaky Clean. I was the neutralizer. I was the balancer. I was the middle child. I guess that comes with the territory. <laughs> but add to that a uh, communication style that never offended anyone. It cost me my personality. It cost me my um, happiness. It cost me my wholeness. Because when I wanted to say something, I chose not to. Oh, I was taught not to. I was conditioned not to. Because saying something meant someone might be angry. And if they're angry, that means hurt and pain for me. And I don't want to live a life of fear, so I chose not to say anything most of the time. And what that did was disintegrate my sense of self, and I became scattered. I became not knowing who I was, and I just survived in the world responding to situations and keeping the peace. I was always the peacekeeper. Great tool when you need it, but if you live your life by it, then you never get what you want in life. You never find happiness. Because how are you going to find happiness if you don't know who you are? When you know who you are and you honor that you, you start to solidify who you are. And the more you learn about who you are, because you're honoring yourself, you're standing up for yourself, you're accepting what's good and not accepting what's bad in your life, accepting the healthy things, uh, rejecting the toxic things. When you do that over and over again, you develop a strong sense of who you are because you're defining your boundaries. You're defining reality for you. This is what I'll accept. This is what I won't accept. Your reality becomes more and more concre concretized. Is that the word? <laughs> more concrete over time. The more and more you honor your boundaries, the more concrete your reality becomes, the more concrete your sense of self is, and the more your reality is shaped the way you want it. I know this sounds a little esoteric, but think about it this way. If you rejected toxicity from your life, 
including people, what would your group of friends and family look like? If you chose not to have the toxic people that you were around growing up and at jobs and relationships, if you had self-awareness enough to honor yourself and go, whoa, this person's toxic for me, I'm getting out of this, how would your life be different today? You would have more of what you want. That's how it works. As you honor yourself, as you define your boundaries, as you reject toxicity and invite healthy people, healthy environments, what's good for you into your life, you create more of your sense of self, more of of who you want to be, more peace and comfort. I know it doesn't always work out this way. I know that you can try and try and just stay in the healthiest environments around the healthiest people and you'll still be dealt a bad hand. And sometimes that hand is dealt over and over and over again. Which brings us back to how can I reestablish or establish for the first time my sense of identity, my sense of self? Who am I? I don't know. I've never had the chance to find out. I've just been this other person that the world knows me as. I think there needs to be a strip away process. You strip away all the toxicity in your life. Or at least, you know, you try this in your mind first. You strip it away. What would my life look like if this person didn't exist? If I was able to honor myself, if I was able to say exactly what I wanted, what would my life look like? What if I could walk into every situation fearlessly? What if I knew I could defend myself no matter what? I mean, these are all questions that you may not have an answer to. Like, I would not walk into the bad part of town knowing I can defend myself no matter what and have confidence. I would have some trepidation. I would have some fear. I am not built (laughs) streetwise. I don't have the confidence that comes with street knowledge. I'm not a guy that spent a lot of time with other people on the street. I don't know what to look for. I don't know all the signs. So certainly there are going to be situations in your life where you don't have the knowledge. You don't have the wisdom. And there are genuinely dangerous situations. It's sort of like the decisions you make in life. It's like uh, you can decide to go skydiving knowing that it could not work out for you. It could be uh, the last time you go anywhere because there's a risk involved. And how much risk are you willing to take in order to grow beyond your fears? I mean, that's an important question. If you have a fear of speaking up in a conference room, if you have a fear of speaking up in public, you know, something that isn't so life-threatening, then how much are you willing to risk to keep yourself whole or to start defining your sense of self? Because that's what it's all about. You take these little leaps of faith and you speak up and find out what happens. Have you ever heard me talk about um, not thinking about the consequences, just doing what's right for you in the moment? That's what I want you to do. I want you to start taking these little leaps of faith. They're leaps of faith because you don't know what's going to happen. I started taking little leaps of faith just to find out what would happen. Because I didn't know what would happen. I just pretended I knew what would happen. When you pretend you know what's going to happen, you minimize success and maximize unhappiness. How about that? (laughs) If you want to minimize success and maximize your unhappiness, don't do what's right for you. Just believe that what you fear will come true. Now let's turn that around. If you want to maximize happiness and minimize failure, always do what you know to be right for you and don't think about the consequences. Now my disclaimer is there are unsafe people that you don't always want to uh, honor yourself in front of because they can become violent or physical. And if you're not ready for that, I don't suggest you do it. But When I look at my own life, I go, you know what? I've lived on this earth long enough and I've avoided every single possible confrontation that I could avoid. And we're talking me being able to talk my way out of uh, physical fights. (laughs) I got to a point where I could talk my way out of a fight. This is where I go with this. I've lived long enough where I'm ready to take a punch if it means honoring myself, honoring my integrity, just so that I can figure out who the hell I am? What am I honoring? 
what have I been protecting all this time? I don't even know because I've put on this fake mask for the world and showing them that I'm this friendly, non-confrontational guy that never wants trouble. No, (laughs) I don't want to wear this false mask anymore. I want to be real. I want to show up in situations as the real me. Because when I show up as the real me, I feel better inside. It feels good. If you've never shown up as the real you, you don't even know what feeling good feels like. I hate to say it. (laughs) You can have all these experiences in the world that made you feel good. But if you couldn't be your authentic self in that moment, you don't know what it's like. It's great. When you show up as your authentic self, you start building or rebuilding your sense of self. You solidify your identity. And in the end, it's not about figuring out who you are. It's about creating who you are. You don't figure out who you are when you never knew who you were. You, you can't. You don't have the information. You create who you are by honoring yourself, honoring your boundaries. And this honoring of yourself builds who you are. Because I believe who you are is defined by being authentically you. Yes, that has a slightly mysterious perception about it. (laughs) The authentic you is who you really are. But who is that authentic you? I don't know. Show up authentically and you'll find out. I know this is a journey. I don't expect you to take massive steps toward it today. But if you could take one tiny little step toward it today and honor that worthy, fantastic, amazing you, you will define yourself. We'll be right back. I want to tell you about GetOutOfTheMess.com. Asha runs the show over there. She is a representative for Legal Shield. Now, what does she do? What she does is answer your questions to figure out if this service is right for you. Because a lot of people ask me, what do I do with this? <laughs> I mean, why don't I just call a lawyer? And I'd be like, heck, if you can afford it, go for it. A lot of lawyers charge anywhere from $250, $350 and up per hour. And I and other members of this service pay $20 a month. And I can talk to a lawyer on the phone and ask them questions. And I don't even have to talk to the same one. I can talk to different specialists uh, in their field all for this low monthly rate. I'm serious. You can do a lot with this service. And I highly recommend it because what you're getting is real advice from real attorneys who are actually doing (laughs) real cases and taking time out of their day to talk with you, a member of Legal Shield. And Aja with Get Out of the Mess can answer your questions about this. Just give her a call at 678 355 8777 and she'll let you know what it's all about. This is for the US and Canada only. I don't know when and if they're going to expand into the world, but uh, the world greatly needs it, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, because there are so many people that get bullied. And I don't want you to be bullied. I want you to have options. I want you to know that there's someone you can call anytime and get help, get information, get advice, get guidance. Heck, even get a will prepared. I mean, the subscription plan includes will preparation. And that's like $600 through a typical attorney. So there's a lot of options through this service. And I want you to check it out. Go to getoutofthemess.com or call Asha at 678 355 Eight seven seven seven. Heck, I didn't even mention that they have like um, identity theft protection and things like that. There are other services that they offer that I never talk about on this show. So there's a lot of options here. 678-355-8777. Give Asha a call today. Welcome back. This is Ask Paul. This is where I read a listener email on the air and uh, do my best to answer uh, their question. Yes, you can send me messages. Paul at theoverwhelmedbrain.com. I can't promise you that I'll answer in a week, but uh, I will answer within usually a month or two. 
Uh, yes, I do have a, a list of questions that I have ahead of you. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, I'd like to answer every single question. Not all of them are answered on the air. Some of them I answer personally. Uh, and of course, you can always do the email coaching. If you need immediate support, you can go to patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com and join the patron program. And there's an option for email coaching in there as well. And you'll get answers a lot faster, like typically within five days. Anyway, let's get to the question today. It's from someone I'm going to call um, Mary. And Mary writes, I'm making preparations to leave an emotionally abusive relationship, but I'm filled with guilt for hurting the man that has treated me so badly. I keep wondering if the reasons I want to leave are good enough. Deep down, I know that the cheating, the emotional abuse, and the threats of violence are enough. But I have this inner dialogue justifying his behavior that runs through my mind. I know my choice is the right one for myself and my children. How do I let go of the guilt and focus on what's best for me instead of worrying about the pain me leaving will cause my husband, especially when he doesn't seem to care about the pain his actions cause me? Okay, Mary, thank you so much for sharing that. You know, some people are going to hear that and go, why don't you just leave him? You know, he's being abusive. He's threatening you. Why not? If you've never been in an emotionally abusive relationship, you don't understand the lockdown feeling or the lockdown that happens. The lockdown is that the emotional abuser does their best to guilt you into staying, to making you feel sorry for them, to making you feel responsible for everything that goes wrong in the relationship to make you feel responsible for their own cheating and lying and behavior. They're brilliant at it. They do it very well. Now, when I was an emotional abuser, yes, <laughs> I was an emotional abuser. I didn't do the cheating and I didn't do the lying, but I did the deception. And I was especially good at the guilt trips. I was really good at the guilt trips and for making my partner feel really sorry for me. I hate to admit this. <laughs> my credibility is going out the window, but I just told someone today that um, the best people helpers out there are the ones who've gone through the most dysfunction and healed. And yes, I was on both sides of this fence. I have been emotionally abused and I have been the emotional abuser. But guess what? There's a little bit in all of us and some more than others. So not everyone is free of this. So yes, I have had an emotionally abusive as the abuser in my past. Not proud of it at all. I don't sit here going, let me tell you how I accomplished this. No, I'm not sitting here doing this saying it's an accomplishment. I'm saying this from a very enlightened, if I may use this word, perspective from being in the space of an emotional abuser. I didn't know I was. I didn't know it until maybe 10 years ago when I finally met someone who pointed it out. She didn't use the words emotional abuse, but I found out later that's what I was doing. And it all had to do with, I want what I want the way I want it, and I'm going to make you feel bad if you can't do that for me. I think that's what happens. There are certain people out there that uh, will do things in a, in a specific way to get their needs met. Some people do it in a very reciprocal way. Like, I will take care of you, you will take care of me, and it's an equal partnership, and everything works out fine. And then there are people that uh, don't believe in that arrangement. The arrangement they set up is very self-serving. How can I serve myself? How can I get my needs met through uh, making others uh, feel bad? unless they meet them. I mean, there's a big one. I used to be able to make my partner feel bad about not meeting my needs. And my needs were sometimes ridiculous. My needs sometimes required them to change their behavior. And this is very common in emotionally abusive relationships. If you change your behavior, our relationship will be fixed. I will be happy and you will be happy because I'm happy. <laughs> and there's a, a whole underlayer of tactic and strategy that, you know, when I was doing it, uh, I didn't realize it was a tactic or a strategy. It was just the way I perceived life. It was the way I perceived reality. It was my normal. 
just like someone else is normal, my partner's normal, my when I was married, my wife's normal, is to be who they are. Compassionate, kind people, not manipulating other people, just going through life, just hoping they have a partner that's reciprocal. So what I want to emphasize is that the emotional abuser is infamously brilliant at making you feel bad and making you feel guilty and making you feel sorry for them. You poor thing. The emotionally abuser will have a sob story sometimes. And that sob story will come up and uh, with words like, I'm trying, I'm trying so hard and just give me one more chance. I'm trying so hard. Things like that. They also have a way of explaining things and rationalizing things to make it look like no matter how you did it, it was wrong. And this is the right way to do it. And until you do it this way, it will always be wrong. And they will have this amazing deduction of logic that will make you feel bad because they sound smart, so they must know what they're talking about. And then there's the guilt, which comes naturally because usually generous, kind, and compassionate people will get with emotional abusers, and the abuser can exploit that compassion and that kindness and that generosity and then point out that you're not being compassionate or kind or generous, which makes you feel guilty, which uh, makes you then uh, give in sometimes. Now, all of these symptoms or signs aren't necessarily indicative of an emotionally abusive relationship. Some of these are indicative of a, a normal relationship. You're going to have conversations with people that uh, th they're going to have a rational argument and it's going to be true. They're going to deduct logically and you're going to figure out, oh, they are right. So this is the tricky part is trying to figure out, well, is that person being emotionally abusive or is that person really right? <laughs> and maybe I did do something wrong. I think this is why it's so hard to assess yourself as an abusee or an abuser because the symptoms are subtle, but the best way to tell is long-term exposure. If it happens over and over and over again, you feel guilty over and over and over again. You feel bad more times than you feel good. And you're also dealing with someone who never seems to take your side, always points out what's wrong, what you're doing wrong. Then you have more symptoms and more signs. And plus, when you're in the middle of it, you can't really always tell what's going on. So anyway, let me get back to this letter. Um, Mary wrote that she is leaving an emotionally abusive relationship, but she's feeling guilt come up. And I want you to remember, Mary, that this guilty feeling is something that is being purposefully uh, initiated in you. And what I mean by that is that the emotional abuser knows your buttons, knows your triggers, and knows that uh, because you're a compassionate person, they're going to say things that highlight where you're not being compassionate. Because you're a kind person, they're going to highlight where you're not being kind. And that's going to be a violation of your value system. And that guilt will actually be self-initiated. So all they have to do is figure out what's important to you and what you feel that's true in yourself and then use that against you. And I want you to look for little indications of that because that's going to happen. Now, along the same lines, because you're compassionate, they're going to cause you to feel bad for them. If they in any way show injury or hurt or pain, your compassion kicks in and now you feel like you need to be there for them. And they know this. They may not know it consciously but they know it works. They know that if they just look hurt in your eyes, like that little hurt puppy, you know, then they're going to be able to get what they want. They're going to be able to get you to stay or feel so bad that you'll make arrangements that don't benefit you, but benefit them. And the whole reason this happens is because they know how to en engage you emotionally. And one of the tips that I give uh, victims of emotional abuse, especially when they're leaving the relationship, because when they leave the relationship, the emotional abuser becomes more brilliant. <laughs> I hate to say it. They become more clever 
in how to activate your compassion, kindness, and generosity. Now, I'm yes, I'm making an assumption that you are compassionate, kind, and generous because, I don't know, 99%, 100% of the time, emotional abusers attract those people into their life because it's easier to get what they want from kind, compassionate, generous people. So I'm just going to make the assumption that you are generally, overall, kind, compassionate, and generous. And because of that, the person you're trying to leave is going to activate the right switches in you to cause you to feel guilty about not being in alignment with your own compassion, kindness, and generosity. <laughs> Let me give you an example. It's sort of like someone who believes in God, follows God, reads the Bible, and tries to practice the, quote, Christian life. And then someone comes along and says, will you help me? Will you give me money? And if the Christian says no, then the person can say, I thought you were a person of God. And then suddenly the Christian feels guilty and then out of guilt gives them money. Maybe, you know, this is just a, a, a minor example, but it's a major manipulation that can happen in the world and does happen. People will use who you are against you and take away your personal boundaries by doing that. I want you to think about that. What personal boundaries are being taken away from you when you feel like you need to help the manipulator or anyone in general, primarily when they're trying to guilt you? Whenever you feel guilty, it's them pushing down a barrier, getting through your personal boundaries, and then using one of your own values against you. If you start to think like this, which value are they trying to use against me? Oh, they want me to feel sorry for them. So they're trying to use my own compassion for humanity against me. Interesting. And now you have at least a little bit of um, understanding of what's happening inside of you. And then you can choose to feel guilty or not. But you have to get to a place where you can understand that's what's happening. You can sense that that's where they're going. And a big way to tell, and this is really important, is that people will be that way in the moment. Like, you can be compassionate towards someone in pain in the moment, and they can say, I'm so sorry, I'll change, I'll do anything it takes. And then three days later, they're the same person they, they were before that moment. When that happens, that is a clear indication that it was a temporary thing to deceive you, to manipulate you, to get you to do what they wanted. All they need is that moment. All they need is for you to uh, submit in that moment and stay so that when the next moment comes and you start going, hey, wait a minute, I thought you were going to change. I thought you were going to be a different person. And then the next moment, they come up with another way or even the same way to activate your compassion, to activate your generosity, to activate your kindness, and then use it against you and then show that you are violating it yourself. It's really complex. I'm, I'm going to have to write a, a, a diagram on this <laughs> and have like a little mind map that points out each and every action these people take to get their needs met. But boy, uh, kind, compassionate people are also the type that feel guilty pretty fast because they feel like, oh, I better be doing something. Otherwise, I'm not being compassionate. I'm not being kind. And one of the biggest pieces of advice I give to emotional abuse victims is to deactivate and disengage from them, especially emotionally. As soon as you engage emotionally, that's when they have you. It's the hook that catches the fish. Once you're engaged emotionally, that is where they reel you in. And it's hard for emotional abuse victims to be cold, to disconnect emotionally. In fact, if you think about it, what is emotional abuse? It is the abuse of your emotions. If you turn off your emotions with them, if you disengage, disconnect, then they can't abuse your emotions. I know, it's not easy. It's not easy not being you. And what you need to do is just not get into the conversation where you feel something with them. 
you have to stick with the facts. And with you, Mary, now you're in a situation where you are leaving and you're feeling guilty for leaving because you believe you're putting him in a bad situation or you feel bad for him or you feel sorry for him or something. And all of your emotions are le- are legitimate because he probably will go through some pain. I'm not going to disagree with that. When I was left and I was the emotional abuser, I felt lots of pain. It was awful. But let me tell you what happened because of that. The person leaving me did me the biggest service ever. You need to get this through your mind, is that you leaving an emotional abuser is the biggest favor you could ever do for them. It is the biggest step towards tough love and helping them heal. It is exactly what I went through. This is why I share my stuff. This is why I expose my past to the world. Because I went through a phase where I was emotionally abusive and then I went through the next phase where someone left me and I had huge realizations that never would have happened had they stayed. And believe me, I went through all the end of relationship behaviors that us ex-abusers do. (laughs) Please don't leave me. I'll change. Please just give me a few more days. Let's work on this. Uh, Let me prove to you. Let me prove it. And one of the big ones is just tell me what to do and I'll do it. That's a huge one. If someone wants to change for you, huge red flag. If instead they go, wow, you just taught me something about myself that I didn't know. I need to work on this. I totally get why you're leaving. I am poisonous. I'm toxic. I completely understand now. Yes. (laughs) Get away from me. Take some time because I need to heal. I need to figure this out. If they come from that place, wow, great. That is a self-empowerment. That is them realizing that they are toxic and they need to change for themselves, not just you. Because what happens when they do change for you and then you're not there one day or you do break up, then they're back to their old self. Typically, that's what happens. Self-empowered change sticks. When you change for someone else, it rarely sticks. It can. I mean, sometimes people are an incentive for you to change. Like, wow, I lost the best thing I ever had. That means I must need changing inside. Again, that encourages you to leave the abuser. That encourages you to not be with them so that they can heal. And you, of course. This is all about really you getting away from the abuser. But how do you do it when you have so much guilt You need to transform that guilt into tough love. I have to do this for you. I have to. I'm not saying you say these words to them, but I have to leave because if I don't, you'll never change. I mean, keep this in mind. If you stay, they don't change. And if you really want me to be tough on you, Mary, if you stay, you're hurting both of you. You're hurting him and you're hurting you. And of course, I didn't even mention your children. Your children are being exposed to how people treat each other. How a mom is supposed to treat a dad and how a dad is supposed to treat a mom. And by staying in a relationship where the mom always feels upset and terrible and guilty and the dad always feels, you know, who knows what they see him as, dominating, controlling. I don't know. They may look at him and go, there's nothing wrong with dad. That's all part of the emotional abuse is that you get emotionally abused and the kids are treated like gold and then... It's mom that appears to be the crazy one. So imagine them staying in a family where mom's the crazy one when it's not true. That's what happens is that you stay in the emotionally abusive relationship. The kids get the perspective that one of the parents paints, the emotionally abusive parent, and the other one is going through the craziness. You know, the gaslighting that emotional abusers do. It's called crazy making. It's going to appear like the abuse victim is the crazy one causing all the problems. So of all the reasons to get out of a relationship like that, kids are a big one because you want to expose them to healthy parenting and healthy environments. Now, you can't control what happens when they're with their dad uh, when you decide to leave, but you can control who you are when you're not with your ex. So hopefully if you really are in this emotionally abusive relationship and you really want to get out, you will get out 
and show your kids what the right thing to do is when you're with toxic people. There's all kinds of things that I can say that support you leaving. The subject of your message is, how do I stop myself from feeling guilty? I say, transform that guilt into a tough love and utilize your compassion for him healing by not listening to the stories he makes up for you to feel bad, for you to feel guilty. Don't engage emotionally. In fact, only use your emotion to be at the higher plane of, I know you think this isn't right, but I know it's the right thing to do. I know you won't like this, but I know it's the right thing to do. Again, you don't necessarily say these words, but you develop this philosophy inside of you, and you believe that what you are doing, even though it could be painful to people, will help them through the challenge of healing from where they are. The emotional abuser needs to heal. Some can, some can't, in my personal belief. I mean, I think that many abusers can, and some just don't want to and never will. Healing only takes place when there's self-realization that what they are doing is abusive, what they are doing is toxic. But it has to be self-realized. And even if someone points the finger and says, you're abusing me, they're either going to agree or disagree. But self-realization leads to self-empowerment, leads to changing for themselves, leads to healing and becoming a different person so that next time you meet, you suddenly feel different being around them. That's when you know change has taken place, is that you feel different around them. And not in fleeting moments. I'm talking about long-term trends. So Mary, I hope this helps. You're going to feel guilty because your compassion, kindness, and generosity are being exploited. So you might have to turn off, disconnect while you deal with him in fleeting moments just so you can get through those moments and be very aware of everything I talked about in this segment. Replay this segment, <laughs> understand and observe and be vigilant in your own behavior so that you don't get sucked into it. Once you get sucked into the drama, once you get sucked into the emotion, then you're right back to where you were. But boy, if you focus on me leaving will help him heal, that might make all the difference in the world. Thanks so much for writing. Good luck with this. Send me an update. I hope to hear from you soon. Oh, and uh, I am just about ready to release the Emotional Abuse Worksheet. So if you want to get your hands on that, it's going to help you identify all the signs of emotional abuse, help you pinpoint where it's happening, and also give you a pathway out of it, whether you want to stay in the relationship or not. Meaning, I'm not telling you to leave. I'm giving you the option, if you stay, do this. If you leave, do that. And uh, I think it's going to be helpful for you too. So um, I don't know if it's going to be released by the time this episode is released. So just go ahead and go to the website, theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash mean. That's M-E-A-N. Stands for Manipulative and Emotional Abuse Number, which it gives you so it kind of classifies where you are in the spectrum of emotional abuse. I hope that helps. Again, the website is theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash mean. Check it out. Thanks, Mary. We'll be right back after this. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to thank the following people on iTunes for leaving their five-star reviews. H. Bettendorf, who says, great information and practical. Also funny. <laughs> Keep up the good work. And then Nanooks3 said, one of the best podcasts to learn to control your mind during traumatic and emotional experiences. Thank you so much. And then Travis L. Michael says, I've spent much of my adult life in a trance of sadness and negativity. I've been listening to this podcast a lot and found it a helpful tool to bring about a shift in my consciousness. Thanks so much for all you do. Uh, I just wanted to read those real quick because um, it was funny. I listened to uh, an older episode of mine. I know sometimes I do that. <laughs> I go back and listen to make sure that uh, the information is relevant, that I wasn't uh, off that day, off base. <laughs> and uh, uh, sometimes just because uh, it's interesting to hear where this show has been. And uh, the episode I happened to listen to or happened to tune into, 
Oh, I remember why I was listening to this specific episode is because I was recommending it for someone who wrote to me. And um, this episode in particular had me reading a bad review of the show. Someone said that if you're an abuse survivor or have PTSD or you're a trauma victim, don't listen to this show. And I was like, oh, wow, I remember that review. And um, I broke it down and read it and gave my opinion about it. And I just find it interesting for every one of those, which I think I've only had like two over the past three and a half years that really criticized the show. I have like a (laughs) hundred reviews that say, you got to listen to this show. So I find it interesting how someone perceives what I talk about on the air as um, really, really good. And then there's that one person out there that says, this is the worst thing you could possibly do. Don't listen. And if you listen to that episode, you know, I should find it. What is it? <laughs> what is what is the one where I read that bad review? Let me take a look. Oh, I remember. It was the uh, toxic episode. It was called uh, the toxic episode. It was the first. Um, the whole title was the toxic episode dash the toxic relationship dash validating toxic friends dash enabling toxic behavior. I think there were three or four segments in there. And I think the first segment is where I read the um, review about the show and how bad it was for everyone. So if you're interested, go check it out. Go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com and you can click on all episodes. And uh, you might have to just scroll down the list. But it is, the date of it is on December 4th, 2016. And you can also do, you know, find on this page in your website. You know how you can find a word in the page? Control F on the browser. Or if you're on a phone, it might be something different. But you can look for the word toxic and you'll see it like four times in that title. Anyway, that was a fun episode. I thought I'd listen to that. Uh, Let me get back to my thank yous. (laughs) In case you're interested, you can check that out. I also want to thank Asha with Get Out of the Mess. Remember, if you're in the U.S. or Canada, this is an excellent service to use. uh, If you have had any inkling to ever call an attorney and save a lot of money just being able to talk with an attorney about anything that's going on in your life or that you want to pursue in your life that you need advice on their time is money and uh, this is why this service was created because not everyone can afford the hourly rate of many attorneys so they came out with this great service give her a call at 678-355-8777 or go to getoutofthemess.com and I want to thank those who purchased the book The Overwhelmed Brain the book is the A to Z of self-empowerment if you feel like you're still stuck in an area of life Maybe the book is exactly what you need. You know, you can go through all these episodes and try to piece together what you can, or you can use the book, which is linearly laid out so that you can take step one, two, three, all the way to Z, uh, one, two, three, A, B, C, (laughs) A to Z to get to a place where you're fully empowered to create the life you want and make decisions that are right for you. Get the overwhelmed brain at Amazon or Barnes and Noble or any of your favorite booksellers today. And I want to thank the members of the patron program. The patron program is a major support system for this show. It helps keep it going. And uh, the members are just phenomenal. If you want to join the patron program and be a supporter of this show, it's not just about supporting the show. It's, It's giving back, yes, but I also give in there as well. I have private episodes, worksheets, training videos, and even email coaching. So take a look if you're interested in that. Patron.TheOverwhelmedBrain.com And for those who are in the patron program right now, I appreciate you. Thank you. And finally, thank you to all of you who are using the Amazon link. Go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com and take that Amazon link and put it on your desktop. And every time you shop at Amazon, use that link so that a small portion of your purchase goes to the show as well. That's a great way to give back. It's very (laughs) non-invasive, very passive, and it is definitely helping. Your shopping habits are making a difference. Thank you. And finally, thank you to Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in the overwhelmed brain. And for this final segment, I'm just going to talk real quick on uh, emotional triggers. Now, sometimes we carry these uh, sensitivities around with us in life. You know, um, we think of something that someone said to us and we get angry. Or we're with someone that every time they open their mouth, we get upset in some way. Or someone gives us a certain look. Or someone does something, like uh, leaves the dirty dishes in the sink again. 
<laughs> and we have all these emotional triggers, these sensitivities that we carry around with us. And every time we think about them, we have a feeling, we have an emotion come up and it doesn't feel good. And sometimes we want to be angry. It's like, oh, if I'm angry, then it shows that they're not getting away with it. Or it shows that they are getting away with it and it makes me angrier. Or you know, we have all these thoughts that come up with it. And I, I like to do a little trick. I taught this um, a while back. It's something that I learned in my coaching, training, and uh, studies throughout the years. And that is um, changing your memories in the sense that when you remember something, you typically remember it the same way each time. I'm talking about like a traumatic or emotionally impactful event in your past. So, for example, my wife, when I was married, my wife used to get upset every time she thought of me saying something to her in the supermarket. I remember the event, and when I said it, she got pissed. <laughs> Can I say that word? And uh, boy, she was upset. And later on, we talked about it, and as we were talking about, she got upset again. And she held on to this upsetness and anger uh, every time she thought about it. So, you know, me being the uh, coach guy in the relationship, which is sometimes dangerous, uh, <laughs> we talked about it and I said, okay, let's try something because I don't want you to be upset every time we talk about it. I want to be able to get through the conversation and yes, I have something to change in me. I have to work on that. Uh, but also, I don't want you to feel this way every time we have a conversation or every time you get triggered. And so let's see if we can like minimize the trigger, you know, kind of uh, soothe the sensitivity. And so we did something, like I said, I learned in my studies over the years called changing history. And what that means is when you have a memory, you remember it the same way pretty much every time. I just said this, I know. Meaning she remembered the way I looked, the what I said, where we were in the grocery store, um, the time of day, who was around us, maybe what I was wearing. She remembered everything in detail. And she saw me in front of her, three feet away, all these little details visually, auditorily. She knew how she felt. So she had that kinesthetic feeling going on. She knew her emotions and uh, all of this stuff really imprinted in her mind. So I said, okay, let's do this. Remember it the exact same way you did, which was no problem. <laughs> she said, oh yeah, I got that. And I said, now, instead of me being three feet away, put me six feet away, you know, envision that and she did, and she's like, okay. And I was like, has the anger increased or decreased? And she said, well, that's about the same. I said, all right, put me 20 feet away. Has it increased or decreased? And she goes, hmm, I guess it feels a little better. And I was like, okay. Now, make the light in the store, you know how it's really bright. I mean, I asked her, is it bright? Is it light? And she, she explained the light to me. I said, make it really dim and make it blue. And so she imagined what it would be like if there was a blue light in the store and I was 20 feet away. And she's like, hmm, that feels different too. Now I said, you know, let's play some corny music in the background. Like there's something coming over the PA that's really corny. I don't know, funky town or circus music is a, a one that I've always heard <laughs> in my trainings. Like play some circus music. Do, 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 do. Now I said, how do you feel now? And she chuckled a little bit. <laughs> she said, I don't feel as angry. So I said, great, let's keep going and see where this goes. I said, now what I want you to do is picture me saying it and you can hear me saying it in the voice that I normally use, but this time change my voice into the voice of a donkey. And if you've been listening to my show a while, you've heard this example. And she immediately started laughing. <laughs> and she heard me say what I said then in a donkey's voice, however that sounds to her. And uh, she laughed. And I said, okay, now, finally, make my head the head of a donkey. <laughs> big teeth, big ears, goofy looking. And she laughed even more. And then I said, okay, great. Let's forget that picture and uh, talk about something else. 
And then I, I don't know what we did. I forget. But then we talked about it again. And as soon as I brought up, okay, how do you feel about that moment? She immediately laughed. And that was different. That was a shift in her emotional state. That changed the trigger. It doesn't mean that there still might not be something to heal in this moment. There were certainly things that I needed to heal from because, uh, frankly, I was a jerk. <laughs> but for her to get past that trigger was really helpful so that she didn't necessarily hold this grudge against me while I did you know, what I needed to do for myself to heal. So this is interesting. It can work with almost any memory that you have. Um, I haven't tried this with people that have severe trauma. Like if you have some severe abuse or something like that in your past, I haven't tried it. I don't know if it would be helpful. I'm not saying that you should or shouldn't. I'm just saying, you know, try this with little stuff that you have triggers for and change the representations in your mind. If it's a really bright uh, room or outside sky, make it dim, make it dark, make it a different color. If you can hear sounds or not, put sounds in there that aren't there. Make it silly sounds. Make the person that you're talking to sound like Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck or Goofy or any Disney character or any character in the world that isn't normally their voice. If you're standing on a hard floor, make it beach sand, make it um, mud. You know, change these little things in your mind because you can. Because you're used to replaying the same thing over and over again the same way. And when you change the memory, even little bits and pieces of it, it actually changes the emotion. Because memories are attached to the emotions. Memories uh, elicit the emotions. And if your memory is different, I wonder if the emotions they elicit will be different too. That's something to try. Give it a shot. Who knows, you might be laughing at something that made you angry for years and years and years. Wouldn't that be nice? If you have any trouble doing this, let me just help you get there by telling you to keep your mind open and step into your power. And when you do that, you'll be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely 100% know to be true about you. You are amazing. Amazing.